19th century, people have been nattering on about the British Constitution, and nobody can find it written down anywhere. But that's the sort of peculiar people we are, the British. We don't need to write everything down. We've got it imprinted on our minds and our hearts. Other countries, however, have their own ideas of constitution, which some of them are now trying to impose upon us. So many things have been said and written about the constitution in the last year that one needs an interpretation by an expert. And today we brought you an expert, and John will tell you his version of the whole constitution fable and put it to rights for you in the way you never will have to worry anymore. For his clarity will solve all the problems. I give you John. So I'm just looking at this from, uh, really I've been involved with engineering and uh, uh, other things in my life and came to uh, the rule of law as a, uh, a point of interest really. Uh, I started researching the matter in uh, about uh, 1999, just soon after the ban on pistol shooting, um, because uh, I used to make bullets for target pistol shooters, and uh, my customers were all taken away from me, and the machinery that I developed to do it was a computerized con controlled machine of my own development. Uh, I got no compensation and so on. So uh, I was put out of business really by the government without compensation for that side of it. Um, and uh, we wrote to the Parliament at the day and said, is, uh, is it really right that Parliament can do just anything? Is, it, is that true? And back came the reply that Parliament is sovereign and they can do what uh, That set me off on the quest to discover what uh, was the constitution of the UK really was. Um, on the way through, I wrote things up and I get to met, got to meet a, a, a leading QC, Leonard Price, uh, and uh, the late Norris McWhirter, who thought that I laid the Constitution, the fundamentals, most clear. And uh, one way or another, it's been uh, quite a, a learning curve. Anyway, really what we've got to consider is that, uh, have we got a written Constitution? Um, and obviously, uh, we're often told that we haven't. Um, but we've got lots of constitutional documents uh, written over many centuries. All those who hold any office are contracted to obey it uh, by their oaths of office and by the rules of law. Um, so that's a fairly straightforward uh, logical assumption that must apply if one is to have a, a, a rule of law. Um, and therefore the question arises really, um, has Parliament been accorded absolute power? Uh, if so, there could be no constitutional limitations to construct it. Um, conversely, if there is constitutional limitation, then it's plain that it ought to act as a firm limitation or boundary, at least until such time as it's changed or altered, uh, and therefore there must necessarily be legal constraint and remedy um, for the people should it become abused. Um, well, one of the most famous documents of all time, of course, is uh, the Magna Carta. And uh, there's a copy at Salisbury Cathedral, not far from here. I expect many of you will have seen that. Um, and of course this was a, a charter uh, which King John was forced to sign. Uh, the intention was to constrain and limit his power uh, and that was indeed the purpose of it. Um, and it's been reconfirmed throughout our history I think some 32 or 33 times uh, at one stage or another. Um, if you wind <coughs> forward to uh, the next really most important uh, occasion was the, the, the Glorious Revolution in 1688. Um, when Magna Carta had fallen into uh, disuse because of the divine right of the Stuart Kings. And uh, once again we had a, an upheaval. Uh, there was a revolution which was relatively peaceful, um, but uh, it was forceful enough to throw James uh, II out. And uh, the settlement terms were uh, made and a declaration of rights was part of the settlement. And the crown was then handed over to William and Mary uh, which were the founders that uh, moved through to the uh, Protestant line of the Hanoverian succession. The document on the right hand side there is actually in the House of Lords Records Office and is actually the Declaration of Rights uh, which uh, I'm holding and that is the original document uh, which was read to William and Mary before they were handed the crown uh, in 1688 uh, as the terms and conditions upon which they could hold the crown and to which they agreed. 
and it was subsequently uh, included with the Bill of Rights, which is the left-hand document there, and once they had uh, re-established the throne in uh, their name, and that was considered to be a lawful parliament, uh, it was decided that uh, people would attempt to try and subvert this again, uh, and therefore uh, a Bill of Rights should be made, and if you read the Bill of Rights, it is a, a bill which says, historically it opens a middle paragraph, said that James had done lots of things wrong, there was a settlement made which came in the form of a declaration, and here it is, and uh, just after the very first top part of that paragraph up there on the, on the Bill of Rights, the first sort of six inches, um, you'll find from there down it's the Declaration of Rights, um, uh, because it cites it and says that's how it is and we're going to confirm it and establish it with a force of law. So that is the uh, fundamentals between the Declaration and the Bill of Rights. Um, the whole point about uh, Magna Carta was that there was a presumption for liberty to be imposed upon the governing authority. Um, and therefore there was limitation of power. Um, the right of enforcement against those that transgressed was not to be uh, trial by uh, diktat from uh, autocratic authority, but by one's peers. Uh, and that, of course, is absolutely vital. Now, people often talk about Magna Carta and say, well, has it been repealed, and in, is it in statute law, is it current, and so on. Well, um, it was confirmed in statute law, and a lot of it has been repealed. However, the bit that they can't repeal is the clause which relates to trial uh, by your peers. So that is still within the statute law book. And, of course, there was, uh, if you've got a, a charter that's going to be constitutional, um, it did the other things. It created a right of redress. Uh, and a right of enforcement, and said that yes, we can take up arms against the Crown uh, under certain circumstances, if there has been total and well-founded abuse. Um, and once redress and uh, remedy have been uh, uh, recovered, then uh, the time uh, allegiance will then once again be uh, returned to the Crown. So it had teeth. Um, there's its uh, statutory version. Um, that one was uh, updated in uh, 1979. If you go to the um, stationery office, you can uh, order a copy of that. Um, no free man shall be taken uh, or imprisoned or deceased of his freehold or liberties or free custom or be outlawed or be exiled or anywise destroyed, nor will we uh, not pass upon him, nor but by the lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. We will sell to no man. We will not deny or defer justice or right and elsewhere it shall not be infringed or broken, it shall be of, had, uh, of no force or effect. So you can see it was intended to be uh, a limiting uh, document. This painting was actually done in the middle of the 1750s, um, but when William and Mary took to the throne, or oh, got the, the crown at the end of the Glorious Revolution, as the settlement of the Glorious Revolution, um, they were offered the crown, as I've explained, with the Declaration of Rights. And this painting was actually done to celebrate that uh, as a subsequent thing. But there you can see the speaker uh, with, the, with the Declaration of Rights, uh, which was read to William and Mary, who were sitting on the throne. Uh, and there's Lord Halifax uh, with the crown waiting to present it to them. Um, so much was thought of the great thing. And this was in the banqueting hall uh, in uh, Whitehall, of course. So, the revolution of 1688 was actually a victory for the supremacy of the law and the separation of power. This is the most vital, important bit that people don't really seem to quite uh, understand, in my view. Um, I believe that the supremacy was put in the, into the law. After all, the divine right of kings was a, a time at which the crown had, in effect, total power of governance. And uh, the king was made to abide by the rule of law. So it was the constraint of the law upon the crown, uh, which was the important point, and it wasn't a transfer of power <coughs> to Parliament, uh, which is what it's taken to be by our political parties today. There was no transfer of power at all. Um, it was only that the crown should hold the rightful and limited power. And so the power was limited by a contract between the people and the monarch to reaffirm the superiority of the rule of law. It was not a victory for Parliament over the crown, and the monarch, as it is frequently and usually portrayed. Um, to prove this point about the transfer of power, as I've explained, the Stuart kings, under their divine right, had, of course, uh, really total power, uh, and there was no dispute as to where the power resided. 
And look what this says in the, in the Bill of Rights. As I explained, it cites the Declaration of it in, in its text, and then it has a long paragraph at the end, um, saying, uh, giving a history lesson, really, to explain what happened. And uh, here it is. And to whose princely persons, the royal state, crown, and dignity of the said realms, with all honours, styles, titles, regalities, prerogatives, powers, jurisdictions, and authorities to the same belonging and appertaining, are most fully, rightfully, and entirely invested and incorporated, united and annexed. So there you can see all the power that the crown had rightfully prior to the revolution, it had after it, at a time when there was no real power of any nature uh, within the commons and, uh, 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 and the lords um, in terms of uh, governing power. The way things were changed, this is probably the most important document of all, um, because once William and Mary had come to the throne, it was decided that we should have a coronation oath and that they needed to make sure that the, uh, the, there had always been a coronation oath, but what wasn't in the, the Stuart King's coronation oath were the words in red, statutes in Parliament agreed on. And so they, they passed an act in April, and uh, then uh, April 1689, uh, and then we, uh, William and Mary were indeed crowned uh, uh, at their coronation and swore this oath. And the red words, as I explained, weren't in the old oath, and so this changed everything because the archbishop or bishop shall say, will you solemnly promise and swear to govern the people of this kingdom of England and the dominions thereto belonging according to the statutes in Parliament agreed on and the laws and customs of the same. Now that is a vital ingredient because once those words were in the coronation oath, it was then obvious that no uh, crown uh, or monarch could deny that they were bound by the statute law because there it was in plain words. Uh, and so it was those words on that parchment, um, and I have to say it's a great thing to be able to go to our House of Lords Records Office and actually get out the original documents from that time, most beautifully written as you can see, all stitched onto, onto vellum, onto, uh, sorry, onto skin stitched together. Um, it's, it's, it's an incredible thing that we have these records uh, in this way. Uh, a constitutionally limited monarchy, therefore, bound by the custom, law, and statute, that was part of the oath. Clearly, the prerogative power, therefore, uh, may not be used in repugnance to the law in force. If the monarchs agreed to abide by the law in force, how can the power of uh, prerogative power of the crown, that's just the monarch's ability to enforce things, go contrary to the law? It obviously can't. Therefore, a limitation of uh, prerogative surely must be that it cannot be used in repugnance to the law. Uh, royal assent is a prerogative of the crown and a constitutional restraint of the law and custom. Well, it must be, mustn't it? Uh, for instance, our Declaration of Rights says that there shall be no torture, uh, no cruel and unusual punishments. There shall be no taxation without representation. Uh, there shall be no standing armies uh, and many other things. And, of course, uh, freedom of speech in Parliament, which has uh, recently hit the headlines with our uh, friend the Speaker uh, and so on. Uh, anyway, that is all part of the Bill of Rights, and those are constraints upon the Crown. And there, of course, are the words that uh, make it utterly clear from the Coronation Oath. There is Queen Elizabeth's Oath on the right-hand side, and her father's on the left. And because I'm a layman, of course, I wanted to check on all these things, so... Uh, I've looked through uh, many law books and uh, references and so on, and uh, it's not me dreaming it up. Here it is, Sir William Baxter, one of our greatest lawyers. However, in what form it shall ever be conceived, this is most indisputably a fundamental and original express contract, and to reduce that contract to a plain certainty, so that whatever doubts might be formally raised by weak and scrupulous minds about the existence of such an original contract, they must now entirely cease, especially with regard to every prince who has reigned since the year 1688. Well, this was uh, 1765 when he wrote his famous uh, commentaries on the laws of England, uh, one of our great judges. Um, so there it is utterly plain uh, that we have a contractual situation uh, regarding the coronation oath uh, and so on. So I thought well, this is very interesting, and uh, having started this quest, uh, I decided to get my MP to ask the then Prime Minister Tony Blair 
uh, a parliamentary question, uh, could uh, a Minister of the Crown recommend a breach of the coronation oath? They, after all, uh, are supposed to abide by true allegiance uh, and uh, so on, and the rule of law. So, uh, kindly, my MP uh, at that time, uh, Howard Flight, um, said, yes, that's a good question. I will uh, send a written question to the Prime Minister. And uh, the Prime Minister found it too difficult to answer. So he delegated it with a letter on the left via Jan Taylor to the then Home Secretary, Jack Straw, who replied on the right-hand side. And uh, there's a bit of delegation on the left-hand side. And on the right, um, you can see uh, the coronation oath. I'm replying in light of my constitutional responsibilities. I can confirm that the coronation oath is a solemn undertaking by the Sovereign and is regarded as binding throughout her reign. Her Majesty would not be advised to give her assent to a provision which contradicted that oath. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. I was very pleased to get that answer. I thought it was the right answer. It's the logical answer. Uh, it's the answer that I should get. Um, why it couldn't have come from the Prime Minister is quite beyond me. Uh, it was a perfectly simple question and should, of course, need asking. Um, but there it is. And um, so we, we had a plain answer. Um, the next thing to do, really, was to look at the Coronation Oath Act again from, and here's the beginning of it, and it's very interesting because the preamble of the Coronation Oath Act tells you why the Coronation Oath was taken. Whereas by the laws and ancient usages of this realm, the kings and queens thereof have taken a solemn oath upon the evangelists at their respective coronations, to maintain the statute, laws and customs of the said realm, and all the people and inhabitants thereof, in their spiritual and civil rights and properties. So there you are, there you have it, those are the purposes of our government. And uh, you can see that by maintaining the subject in their spiritual and civil rights and properties, you are maintaining the liberty of the subject and the people. So it gives and defines a purpose for governance. And the second promise of the coronation oath, very important, will it your power cause law and justice and mercy to be executed in all your judgments? King or Queen, I will. And then, of course, the final sign-off at the time. I, uh, so, uh, the things which I have here before promised, I will perform and keep, so help me God. Uh, the King and Queen shall then kiss the book. And at that point presented uh, with a, a large Bible. Um, one of my friends, uh, who's been involved with this for a long time, spotted this on eBay and uh, kindly bought it for me for seven pounds. Um, and it's an original line print from the middle of the 1700s, and it depicts, as you can see, the Declaration of Rights being uh, read to William and Mary. <coughs> and it was for the Earl of Huntington. Um, and if you look at the text at the top, it says, the clerk of the Crown, reading the Bill of Rights, of course it was really the Declaration, uh, to the Prince and Princess of Orange in the banqueting house at Whitehall, previous, to the offering of the crown. So there you have it, previous to the offering of the crown, there's no doubt about what happened, um, and it was celebrated uh, subsequently very much. And of course, 300 years later, um, we had a shindig in our House of Commons and, and in the Westminster Hall, uh, Westminster, and the Queen, uh, well, many heads of the Commonwealth states and so on, the Queen was asked to make a, a, a speech and uh, in it she said, experience has taught that peoples can enjoy the full fruits of liberty, security and justice only when they are represented in a sovereign legislature whose laws are interpreted by an independent judiciary. The Bill of Rights and the Scottish Claim of Rights of 1689, still part of the statute law, are the sure foundation on which the whole edifice of parliamentary democracy rests and had great influence abroad, especially in the United States of America and in the Commonwealth. Well, that's very interesting, isn't it? It's the sure foundation. Well, that's, again, incredibly useful for us. And we subsequently had uh, struck a two-pound coin uh, to commemorate it, uh, and there it is. And there was the Scottish Claim of Rights. The Scottish had a, an independent Claim of Rights uh, at the same time. Oh, sorry, that's a, the Bill of Rights, and then there's a Scottish Claim of Rights. Um, there, which was their silver coin. Um, and interestingly, um, here was the other side of that first little presentation from the Mint. And if you look at the top left there, 
um, you can see a document with an ink splodge on. Um, and also, it's interesting that in here, of course, in this text, uh, the Declaration was principally an assertion of the rights of Parliament in its relations with the Crown, and effectively confirmed a shift in the balance of power from the Crown to Parliament. Well, I don't think that's really quite an accurate description. Um, there wasn't really a shift of power. Um, what the Crown couldn't do was to deny the law. And the, but the principle is that the Commons and the Lords advise the Crown uh, on its use of power. Uh, and the Crown would not generally go against that advice, but quid pro quo, that advice must also be for the purposes of the Constitution. Um, that is uh, quite plain. Anyway, it's interesting. Um, there is uh, the ink splodge document on the top left, as you saw, and that was actually a draft of the Declaration of Rights on the right-hand side there, on which the clerk spilt the ink. Um, so uh, it's quite a, an amazing thing. They still even have a, have a draft, a uh, handwritten part of it. Um, but it's surprising, isn't it, that in the Mint's uh, document, they don't actually put, we've got the, the whole document uh, exists, and they didn't actually show us to pitch, put a picture of that, they just had a picture of the one with the ink splodge on it. Um, I don't think that would be the same in America. Um, so having discovered these things, I thought, well, what does Parliament think about all this then? So I dug out Erskine May, which is parliamentary practice and their parliamentary handbook, and thought we'd better have a look at that. And the same thing is confirmed in this bit of text from Erskine May. The Act of Settlement affirms that the laws of England are the birthright of the people thereof. And all the kings and queens who shall ascend the throne of this realm ought to administer the government of the same according to the said laws. And all their officers and ministers ought to serve them respectively according to the same. The succession to the Crown Act, 1707, of course this was an anti-Jacobite measure, declared it high treason for anyone to maintain and affirm by writing, printing or preaching that the kings or queens of this realm, by and with the authority of Parliament, are not able to make laws and statutes of sufficient force and validity to limit and bind the crown. Well, those words are very important. They're saying, in principle, if you just wrote a document up that said that the law was of insufficient force to limit and bind the crown, you were committing high treason. That was not repealed until 1967. Um, so that's pretty important. And nor was this a modern principle of constitutional law established for the first time by the revolution of 1688. If not admitted in its whole force so far back as the great charter of King John, it has been affirmed by Parliament in very ancient times. So there we have it, Parliament's very own handbook, stating quite clearly that the law limits and binds the crown and the government thereof. There is the actual Act of Settlement from 1701, and uh, at the top, whereas the laws of England are the birthright of the people thereof, and ministers ought to observe them respectively according to the laws, a little bit underlined in red on the left there. So, quite clearly the law is meant to be obeyed. Uh, I'll come back to this, but the cabinet members swear oaths of office. Uh, the words in black I'll come down to in a little bit later on. Um, MPs have a code of conduct. In their code of conduct, it says that they have a, a duty to be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty the Queen, her heirs and successors according to law. <coughs> Members have a duty to uphold the law and to act on all occasions in accordance with the public trust placed in them. Well, the public trust placed in them is to abide by our constitutional law and be in compliance with it to maintain the liberty of the subject. In an official reply from the Lord Chancellor's Office, uh, I managed to get them. It took me ten letters to get this out of them. I would agree that we are all subject to the rule of law and that this is a fundamental and an essential principle of democracy because I was asking them whether they could suspend the rule of law. And therefore, we come to this uh, fundamental relationship. The Constitution, therefore, should be all-powerful. Uh, and Parliament is only a component uh, within it. Our Constitution does not empower Parliament with unlimited or absolute power. Upholding our Constitution is the preeminent public duty of all who hold office. It should always be their certain policy. Well, it certainly should. Um, this doesn't mean to say that the constitutional parts cannot be altered or changed. Um, some may or may not be entrenched. That's a separate argument. But what it does say is that there are rules of law that are written up, that are current law, 
and that they must indeed be obeyed. Um, the degrees of entrenchment are another matter. We don't need to worry too much about that. Uh, we have written law that is current. The people's liberty is upheld at the discretion of their juries. Well, again, we mentioned that in the first place. And uh, perverse verdicts are the ultimate common law proof of the limitation of statute. Well, of course, uh, in the Ponting trial in the late 1900s, when uh, Mr. Ponting uh, decided to spill the beans on an official secrets uh, uh, issue, um, they pursued him in the courts, um, and they didn't like it. And there was a spy catcher affairs and all those things, as you will no doubt recall. Um, but the jury wouldn't convict him. They said, no, it was in the public interest, and uh, we're jolly pleased about that, so Mr. Ponting was allowed to go free. So the establishment wasn't able to uh, override him. And indeed, there's been a recent case, um, uh, very important indeed in my view, uh, Wang, uh, a martial arts instructor, uh, was mugged on a railway station and had his bag taken from him. I think he was in the loo at the time. And he managed to catch up with the thief uh, and uh, cornered him. And the thief at that point was opening the bag and uh, discovered that it was a samurai sword within the bag and said, oh, well, you're not going to call on your mobile, mobile phone as it was the police, are you? Because you've got a, a bladed weapon in a public place. Um, and Wang was having none of it and called the police, who, of course, came along and arrested both of them. And Mr. Wang gets taken to court, uh, and the judge directed the jury to find him guilty of having a, an offensive weapon in a public place. Um, so they appealed, and uh, there was a unanimous verdict given in the House of Lords in which the verdict uh, was read that uh, the judges said that they could find that there are no circumstances under which a judge may direct the jury to find someone guilty. Well, quite right too, but isn't it incredible that it should get to a court case where that had happened, that somebody had directed a jury that they must be guilty? An absolute offence, which of course is the nature of the administrative thing, versus the rule of law, which is about the common law, and is centred on justice, which is to do with intent. Um, entirely different. Now, if we go back to the uh, uh, year 1530, uh, one Richard Rose had uh, poisoned uh, the Bishop of Rochester's uh, cooking, and he mortally wounded, it says in this act, 17 people. Henry VIII thought that poisoning was a very dastardly thing and would be treasonous and that he should teach all poisoners a lesson and so he passed this act against poisoning. It is incidentally the oldest act that I've handled from the House of Lords Records Office um, but it's very nasty if you're Mr. Richard Rose um, because this instructs that Mr. Richard Rose shall be therefore boiled to death and he was indeed duly boiled to death at Smithfield and I was able to confirm that there's a little bit of text uh, where it says it. Uh, Richard Rose shall therefore be boiled to death. Um, and Hall mentions another act, that those who poison any person should be put into hot water and boiled to death. Hmm. This act uh, was made, I see, because one Richard Rose in the Parliament time had poisoned diverse persons in the Bishop of Rochester's palace, for which act he, in fact he was duly boiled to death in Smithfield. Well, you can see that these... Uh, powers could be very great indeed. And uh, Henry VIII considered himself to be pretty dictatorial and he had his act of proclamations in effect to put his word uh, to be the law. Uh, but nevertheless, by and large, he tried to abide by the common law of the day. Um, but uh, Sir William Blackstone was quite clear that the act of proclamations was a, a, a treason at the time. However, uh, what happened, of course, was that we came to 1688 and those powers were taken away from the Crown, quite clearly. And the Declaration of Rights has this text, that excessive bail ought not to be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. And therefore, if the Crown is under that obligation, how could it lend its royal assent to a bill to create cruel and unusual punishment? Now, if we ask a person in the high street, what do they think about Constitution? Um, well, I say, well, we haven't got one, but the Americans have got one. Um, and so there it is. That's the American Bill of Rights. Um, and the ordinary chap understands that they have a, a Constitution that's there to try and control their executive. 
uh, and therefore it is a matter of the law controlling the powers of governance. Well, guess what? They copied part of ours almost word for word. And there's the tenth article, excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. And all this is exactly the same principle, that it's about law being obeyed as a logical declaration uh, beforehand of what behaviour uh, must be in relating to the items uh, in, itemised in the, in the rules of law, um, so that we can all judge our actions accordingly. So the Americans have used exactly these same principles to build their constitution, i.e. its oaths of office, its written law uh, that is agreed uh, and published. In America, constitutional law is supreme. Now this is where we part with the Americans. In 1803, they had a contest, and it was called Marbury versus Madison, and conflict uh, because Cong Congress passed a law which was in conflict with the constitutional documents uh, that were there. And uh, Chief Justice Marshall uh, made this. Chief Justice Marshall declared that in any such conflict between the Constitution and the law passed by Congress, the Constitution must always take precedence. Section 13 of the Judiciary Act passed by the Congress in 1789 was found to be unconstitutional and thus invalid. They didn't have really a higher formal author or authority of law as such. It was just recognizing the principle that there was a boundary, and if you went over the boundary, then something had to give. Well, it shouldn't be the, consti the Constitution that gives. It should be the uh, encroachment by the new enactment. Um, otherwise, the Constitution clearly is mechanically uh, uh, useless or a waste of time. And, of course, the means to get connected for the people back to their Constitution was to have a petition, petition for redress of grievance. And of course the Americans copied that as well from our documents, so that we could petition the Crown on a logical basis. And I believe that petitioning uh, should mean that there are mandatory conditions upon the Crown uh, under certain circumstances, if there is absolute violation of the fundamentals. Now, in 1929, Lord Hewitt of Berry was the then uh, Lord Chief Justice, and he wrote this book, The New Despotism, and chapter 4 was entitled Administrative Lawlessness. Well, as a sitting Lord Chief Justice to publish a book with administrative lawlessness as chapter 4 was a bit of a shock for the establishment. Uh, and so uh, they decided that uh, what he was saying was that in effect laws were being passed which were devolving powers to ministers to make rules and regulations. And when those rules and regulations were made, they would in effect be as if they were part of the law enacted by Parliament. So what Parliament was really doing was licensing lots of little despots. And of course this was the fundamental of the administrative system. And Hewitt said, well this isn't justice, um, and uh, complained about it, and he wrote this book. and. Uh, it caused a, an upheaval, so they decided to have a committee on ministers' powers to see what powers ought to exist and whether there should be uh, Henry VIII powers, as they got known after Henry's act of proclamations, where he could declare things to be the law, and whether there should be Henry VIII powers available. And guess what? They cited the extreme examples of power of government. And they cited, that is how I found out about the boiling to death of the Bishop of Rochester's cook, they cited that as an extreme power that was open to Parliament to utilise. Uh, and they said, look, we can do this, and of course we could have Henry VIII powers if we wanted to. They were there, that's what was had. And they made no mention of the constraint and restrictions in, of 1688 and the Bill of Rights uh, and the changes in the Coronation Oath at that time. So I believe that that port report is ill-founded. Now, that's rather important because, uh, well, firstly, in, in, within the report is a wonderful bit of text, um, and uh, it's a very good report in many ways, but uh, this is very revealing. The most distinctive indication of the change of outlook of the government of this country in recent years has been its growing preoccupation, irrespective of party, with the management of the life of the people. 
A study of the statute book will show how profoundly the conception of the function of government has altered. Parliament finds itself increasingly engaged in legislation which has for its conscious aim the regulation of the day-to-day -day affairs of the community and now uh, intervenes in matters formerly thought to be entirely outside its scope. This new orientation has its dangers as well as its merits. Between liberty and government there is an age-long conflict. It is of vital importance that the new policy, while truly promoting liberty by, better secure, by securing better conditions for the life of the people of this country, should not in its zeal for interference deprive them of their initiative and independence, which are the nation's most valuable assets. Well, I think we'd all, without exception, feel that that's really come true. Um, how much administration is uh, restricting uh, the zeal uh, for interference, how much is that restricting the initiative and the independence of the people today? Uh, it's colossal. Well, they spotted it way back then, um, and we would give a lot to go back to the amount of law that they had at that time. Anyway, because of that uh, report, um, that was in 1932, and then of course things fostered on through the 30s, and they tried to do things in line with that report, um, and of course the war came along and interfered and then immediately after the war with the Labour government they decided that the best thing to do would be to formalise all the use of prerogative powers as orders and regulations and rules uh, and uh, create statutory instruments so that they should all be numbered and that all the uh, orders and rules would be written down and numbered uh, accordingly and so this is very interesting because this is the Statutory Instruments Act of 1946 which the whole thing uh, comes alive from. And uh, you'll notice quite clearly there that it talks about subordinate legislation on its title page. Um, so it's quite clear that all rules and regulations, which most of us think of as being the law, um, because they are there, they're not the, the, the primary bits of the law, they're very much secondary area. Uh, and as you can see, it even admits on the front cover subordinate uh, legislation. Now just to show that there's been no shift in power in principle, um, bills are not enacted until they have their royal assent. And quite clearly here, um, what happens, everybody thinks the Queen should rush down to the House of Parliament, or a lot of people are under the misconception that uh, royal assent is given by the Queen signing uh, the Act. Uh, that doesn't happen at all. Um, uh, the Queen delegates her authority, her royal authority, uh, to her cousins, as they are referred on the document here, which is a letter patent, and unfortunately this photocopy in the black splodge at the bottom is the Great Seal of England, um, and it doesn't show up well there. But uh, the Queen delegates her authority so that her cousins may pronounce her agreement to the acts that are listed on the schedule. And this is a very important document because the central act of the acts on the schedule uh, with the European Communities Act 1972. So this is the actual document or the letter patent above which allowed the uh, royal assent to be given to the acts on the schedule and there's also a very important bit of text there because it shows that the power still resides with the crown and it's set forth in the schedule here too but the said acts are not a force or effect in law without our royal assent um, and so there you have it the, the crown still holds the power And of course, what's happened is administration has got above itself and they now believe that when the Constitution for Europe came along that they're in a position to uh, actually get to the point where the Constitution and law adopted by the Union's institutions in exercising competencies conferred on it shall have primacy over the laws of member states. Well, that of course is uh, contrary to much of our fundamental constitutional position uh, which is cited at law. Um, but here, we got to the point where the administration and government of the day believe that it's just a question of uh, them agreeing to these things, and off we go. And, uh, of course, the Constitution became the Lisbon Treaty, and as we know, that is currently held in abeyance, although our Prime Minister uh, has agreed to its signing, so uh, that has come through from the Crown. 
I mentioned the Privy Council's oath earlier on, we saw it, and the little black bit of text is very important uh, because they all swear to abide uh, by true allegiance uh, to the Crown. And there you have it. You will to your uttermost bear faith and allegiance unto the Queen's Majesty. That's not a, um, the, a, a, the person of the Queen, it's the Queen's Majesty, i.e. the Majesty of the institution of the Crown, what she represents. And will assist and defend all jurisdictions, preeminences and authorities granted to Her Majesty and annexed to the Crown by Acts of Parliament or otherwise against all foreign princes, persons, prelates, states or potentates. Very, very important. Um, they don't seem to take much notice of that. And indeed, Mr. Mandelson was rather embarrassed when questioned uh, by uh, Nigel Farage some time ago as he was taking up a position in Europe. Uh, and he got on news at 10 uh, at the time that uh, he was asked about his conflicts uh, of his two oaths of office. Um, but he just shrugged it off. Um, extraordinary. Um, William Pitt, one of our great uh, well, prime ministers, um, to say that if the Commons had passed an unjustifiable vote, it was a matter between God and their own consciences. Of course, he was speaking from the Lords. And nobody else had anything to do with it. It was such a strange assertion as he had ever heard. And it involved a doctrine subversive of the Constitution. What if the Commons should pass a vote abolishing this House, abolishing their own House, and surrendering to the Crown all the rights and liberties of the people? Would it be only a matter between God and their own consciences? And would nobody else have anything to do with it? You would have to do with it. I should have to do with it. Every man in the kingdom would have to do with it. And every man in the kingdom would have a right to insist upon the repeal for such a treasonable vote and to bring the authors of it to condign punishment. I therefore again call upon the noble lord to declare his opinion, lest he will lie under the imputation of being conscious to himself of the illegality of the vote and yet being restrained by some unworthy motive from allowing it to the world. <coughs> Lord Mansfield replied not. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? Look at those words. Uh, and surrendering to the crown all the rights and liberties of the people. Well, that's the situation we find ourselves in today. Um, and, of course, it isn't rightful. The law defines that Parliament isn't sovereign. The Constitution gives supremacy to the law, not to Parliament. That is the current law in force, the current law of the Constitution. It doesn't mean to say that Parliament can't alter it. Uh, it they may or may not be able to alter the laws. Um, but we only need really concern ourselves with what is in force. That is the current Privy Council's oath of office. The current Privy Council uh, are sworn to it. If you go to their website, uh, even a few months ago as I did, uh, you will see it on there. The coronation oath is a contract by which we must be governed. It secures the supremacy of the law over both Parliament and the Crown. But it's vital, isn't it? Yeah. To pass powers of governance to those who owe no allegiance to the Crown, and thus the people, uh, must be utterly unconstitutional. Uh, and they are unaccountable to, unelected by, and not removable by the electorate of the UK. Uh, again, must be entirely unconstitutional. Uh, what happens to the laws being our birthright? Acceptance of the supremacy of the EU law is a subordination of our constitution to a foreign power. To accept the supremacy of EU law, the Queen will of necessity have to renounce her coronation contract to facilitate the dismantling of our existing constitution or be put in breach of her oath. Well, it seems to me that that must be the case. Um, and uh, it's interesting that in the King of the Belgians uh, uh, did actually abdicate for a day to take a new coronation oath um, over uh, Catholicism. Um, Bowles versus Bank of England, very important court case in 1912. Um, the budget failed, um, and uh, Mr. Bowles is obviously a very wealthy man. I think he had a dividend that uh, could have been in the order of £30,000. And the revenue came to tax him uh, on it, and he said, Not on your life, you haven't got an act uh, to take my money from me. No taxation without representation, go away. So they said, no, we're taking your money. He took it to court and he won his case. And it was said, the Bill of Rights still remains unrepealed. No practice or custom, however prolonged or however acquiesced in, on the part of the subject can be relied on by the Crown as justifying any infringement of its provisions. So that's very strong stuff. And then more recently, in 1976, um, we are obviously in the 
late 60s, we didn't have many color television sets, and most of them were black and white, and uh, color was just coming in in the late 60s, early 70s. And so they saw a chance to get a bit more tax, because there used to be just a television license, as most of you will remember. And uh, it, I think, cost £12 uh, in the uh, 1970s. And they decided that with the advent of colour television, they could get a bit more out of everybody by having a colour television licence. So instead of having just a television licence, we had a black and white and a colour television licence. Um, and there was a, an extra charge of £6 uh, for the colour licence. And uh, Mr Congreve, uh, very brightly, went to his uh, local uh, post office right before the uh, advent of the increase and bought a new television licence. And so subsequently the uh, Home Office wrote and all revenue and said uh, you owe us uh, uh, six pounds because uh, your television licence uh, uh, has been outdated now, that's just for black and white television licences uh, and uh, therefore you must pay up. And he said, oh no, not at all, my television licence is for television um, and until it runs out in a year's time I don't need to pay the extra six pounds. Well, he advertised what he was doing and 44,000 other people had done exactly the same thing. <laughs> um, so it was very good. And uh, I believe that he was a solicitor to the Queen at one time. And uh, anyway, uh, the outcome was that uh, he went to court over it and uh, he won his case. And there's this wonderful statement by Denning. There is yet another reason for holding that demand for six pounds be unlawful. They were made contrary to the Bill of Rights. They were an attempt to levy money for the use of the Crown without the authority of Parliament. And that is quite enough to damn them. Uh, strong stuff indeed. <clears throat> the House of Commons, 21st of July 1993. Uh, parliamentary privilege comes from the Bill of Rights. And so we see that uh, when it comes to the House of Commons wanting to know whether the Bill of Rights should be uh, upheld, they're very clear about it. The question of parliamentary privilege arose in this well-known case, Pepper versus Hart. Madam Speaker, the Bill of Rights will be required to be fully respected by all those appearing before the courts. Uh, the privilege is confirmed in the Declaration of the Bill of Rights, 1688-9, in what has become known as Article 9. They're not actually numbered in the uh, uh, documents. Um, but that's extremely interesting because when it comes to Parliament uh, and the Commons, uh, for their use, we can expect the Bill of, Bill of Rights to be fully uh, respected. Well, that's extremely handy because I think it ought to be and it would do a great deal for us. Um, Mr. Blunkett had a confrontation with some asylum seekers and uh, the, uh, the, the rule of law uh, let the asylum seekers go and uh, so there was a conflict and uh, this article appeared. Uh, Lord Wolfe was asked what would happen if there was a clash between parliamentary sovereignty and the rule of law. Because if you think about it, what I'm saying is that Parliament isn't sovereign, it's the rule of law that is sovereign. It's the law that is superior, not Parliament. Uh, his sober answer was the question ought not to be asked. And then the <laughs> reporter, of course, very wisely, but it must be. And of course it's the law that must be superior, <coughs> otherwise we have no constitutional restraint. And if we go back to Lord Hewitt's book, um, he noticed what was going on and put it very eloquently. But how far more attractive, and this was about talking about the ability of the administration to use uh, administrative rules and regulations to undermine the actual fundamentals of the rule of law itself. Um, so that's what, what he's talking about here. But how far more attractive to the ingenious and adventurous mind to employ the one to defeat the other and to establish a despotism on the ruins of both it is manifestly easy to point to a superficial contrast between what was done or attempted in the days of our least wise kings and what is being done or attempted today. In those days, the method was to defy Parliament, and it failed. In these days, the method is to cajole, to coerce, and to use Parliament, and it is strangely successful. The old despotism, which was defeated, offered Parliament a challenge. The new despotism, which is not yet defeated, is Parliament an anaesthetic? The strategy is different, but the goal is the same. It is to subordinate Parliament, to evade the courts, and to render the will or the caprice of the executive unfettered and supreme. 
And what about that from 1929? <coughs> Tell me we can't learn from history. It's utterly plain that that same trick is going on today. Mm -hmm. And that is what we're up against. And there are lots of insidious things. And one of them, I believe, is the Ministry for Justice. Uh, because it portrays justice as being something as a matter for a minister's decision. Justice is about intent and about the people's decisions made in their juries. It's not about the autocracy of the state and its power. And therefore, trial by jury are topical issues, presumption of innocence and intent, uh, the right of self-defense, the Ministry of Justice, which I've just talked about, the House of Lords and the Supreme Court, well, the Supreme Court that we're going to get. Uh, the judges are more appointed, or more nearly appointed by the politicians. They won't be long before they're fully appointed by the politicians. That's the whole point. How can that be governing us in accordance with our custom? I believe it to be utterly unconstitutional, inasmuch that there is no Supreme Court. Uh, there is nothing above the Supreme Court. There's no appeal into the High Court of Parliament, where, of course, our representatives sit in the form of the Commons as our MPs. Uh, ID cards, uh, emergency powers, and of course DNA I haven't put up there, but it's another thing. Administration, devolution, fishing, fox hunting, right to roam. Under the right to roam there was no compensation to landowners for any devaluation of their land. Alternative medicines have been regulated out of, uh, out of business um, without special certificates and so on. Uh, and so one's initiative and freedom and liberty uh, is being encroached upon more and more. And the art markets, of course, are all coming under uh, contracts for uh, uh, to be uh, compliant with the VAT laws and, and so on. In terms of oaths of office, um, those who served in the trenches and the wars, um, some of them are under the most horrifying conditions imaginable, uh, bullets and shell fire and all the rest of it, apart from the misery of it all. Um, they had terrible conditions. And they couldn't get out of the trench and, and go and fight because they were too scared or they went weak at the knees. And they were held to be in breach of their oaths uh, of allegiance to the crown. Uh, and some of them were shot and others uh, court martialed and so on. Um, so some paid with their lives when they were under very trying circumstances. Um, but it doesn't seem our MPs put the same degree uh, of allegiance into. Uh, the oaths of officers, perhaps soldiers have been forced to in the past. Well, that's how it strikes me. Uh, the Bill of Rights is described by Sir William Blackstone as the undoubted duty of the King. Um, so there you are, there you have it, one of our greatest judges making plain uh, the duty of the state. All that I've mentioned here today is current statute law, as I pointed out earlier. And there are the current statutes that cite as statute law all the bits that we've uh, mentioned. Uh, and so I think now that one can make a conclusion uh, that we have no written constitution. Well, plainly there are lots of written bits of constitution uh, and therefore the no written constitution is false. We have a constitutionally limited monarchy. Well, you've seen how it was done. Uh, it was done by oath of office uh, and by the rule of law. So that is true. Uh, the Crown accepts the advice of ministers well, surely there must be limitation. There has to be limitation. How can the Crown introduce cruel or unusual punishment or taxation without representation? Features of our Bill of Rights. Uh, until that is repealed and taken out of the law, and indeed it was a condition upon which the Crown was handed over, uh, which is obviously an entrenchment, uh, and the coronation oath uh, was taken at a time when it was the law. So by prior uh, being, by grandfather right, our Bill of Rights must have uh, some controlling duty to be inflicted and imposed uh, on our politicians until such time as it's rescinded. Uh, it says it is the duty of all officers and ministers whatsoever. Uh, and therefore that is what it is. It is a matter of law. The Crown in Parliament is said to be sovereign. Uh, well, yes, it's the Crown in Parliament that can make and unmake the law. But whether it can unmake all law is uh, questionable. Um, but it is certainly under the rule of law that is current at any one time. Uh, and then, of course, the other argument, no parliament may bind its successor. And people talk about this endlessly. Um, we don't really need to worry about it. Um, this is a question of whether 
we should be ruled by dead man's shoes forever. Um, well, to that extent, one would say that, well, things ought to be ultimately alterable. Well, whether they are or they aren't, you can't use that doctrine that no parliament may bind its successor to undermine the law that is there for constitutional purposes and currently in force. But that is what is being done. People are trying to say, or parliamentarians are getting the impression, that there is no law to control or bind uh, what their policies ought, ought to be. Uh, and the people may not be separated from their courts. And that, of course, is utterly vital. Um, but it is the object of nearly all administrative means is to create direct mechanisms for enforcing the law, whether it's fines, direct fines, or so on. Uh, and so this was Lord Hewitt of Berry's uh, great complaint, um, that the constant attack by the administration is always to devise means to separate the people from their courts because it's administratively convenient. And therefore, I concluded that in my view, the Constitution uh, really means this. The rule of law, that is our constitutional law, limits the Crown and thus restricts the Crown in Parliament and defines the role of Parliament and government and its relationship to the people uh, and the separation of powers. And that, of course, is absolutely vital. Uh, we have separation of powers. I believe that, it, uh, that, that, that the Crown, uh, Parliament cannot do what the Crown cannot do. And William Pitt, uh, on this subject matter, instead of the arbitrary power of a king, we must submit to the arbitrary power of the House of Commons. If this be true, what benefit do we derive from the exchange? Tyranny, my lords, is detestable in every shape, but none so formidable as where it is assumed and exercised by a number of tyrants. But, my lords, this is not the fact. This is not the Constitution. We have a law of Parliament, we have a statute book, and the Bill of Rights. And therefore, I conclude that under the rule of law, there can be no divine right of politicians. And it's wonderful and to tell me that you can't learn from history. Uh, history is so plain. And when in subsequent ages, the state, swollen with its own authority, has attempted to ride roughshod over the rights or liberties of the subject, it is to this doctrine that appeal has again and again been made and never as yet without success. Mm -hmm. Well, that is what we must do. We must appeal to the doctrine. And the doctrine is the rule of law. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. I think we'd best now have a break.